if somebody decides to write a song about me, I imagine it'd go like uh, something like, he's an above average father. It's who he is. It's who he is. I mean, if God's a good, good father, what does that make me? Jeesh. Talk about high standards. Hey, can we, can, we, uh, can we just take a second here to... How do I do this? Can we, can we, get, can we get me in there? No? Oh, there we go. There we go. I just always wanted to do that. I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've got three boys so far, and uh, Sebastian, Frank, and Xavier, and uh, they're, they're a riot. Kids are crazy. Uh, do we have a picture of, of these boys? I, living in a house full of boys is just, you, you say that, you don't know them. <laughs> You're just like, they look cute. They're crazy. So yeah, Frank and then Xavier and Sebastian. Frank is the middle child. And uh, I, how, how many middle children do we have here? All right. Sorry. Um, so after mass, they're doing a fundraiser. And uh, I, by the way, do you think they look like me? I don't know. If you, it's, hard, it's hard if you like imagine them with facial hair. Maybe it, it helps. <laughs> Good-looking boys. Someday, guys, someday. Anyway, a after Mass, they're having a fundraiser for the Pro-Life Pregnancy Center, so they're handing out baby bottles with a little note inside, and you're supposed to take them home, fill them up with change, bring them back, and it's a donation to the Pro-Life Pregnancy Center. I thought, oh, this is a great opportunity. We'll do some, some activities that the boys could do, some chores that they can earn money and put it in there and teach them a little about, you know, making money and supporting people, and it would be a great thing. So we grab bottles for each of the boys, and I'm in the back of church talking to a friend, and up comes Frank holding one of his bottle, right? And he's, he's just drinking it. He's drinking, he's got, it's, he's got water in it. And he's four years old. He hasn't had a bottle in three years. I was like, Frank, where did you get that water? You're jumping ahead of me. He said, <laughs> around the corner, the water spigot. Yeah, I was like, Frank, that's holy water. That's, that's to fill up your little things with holy water. And that's when I realized I need to give the kids a tour of the church and explain what things are. And uh, he said, I was thirsty. You're thirsty? Just get some water, you know? And we've been talking about being thirsty. Kelly was talking last night about being thirsty. And whenever you're thirsty, you just want water. Yeah, I, I had a friend, I was down in Atlanta, and a friend of mine was said, hey, you should run the marathon with me in Chicago. I'm signed up, I'm going to run the Chicago marathon. You and your friend Dan should run with me. I said, no, we shouldn't. No. There's, there's, there's not a whole lot of things I know, but one of them is that I should not run this marathon with you. And... Uh, he peer pressured me, and I gave in. And so we didn't have time to, to like do the full training for a marathon, so I'm like cramming in these, these trainings and runs and everything. And uh, my buddy Dan gets injured, so he's like, I, I can't do it. My knee's messed up. And then Mike, the guy that talked us into it in the first place, gets injured. He says, I can't, I can't run it. And I'm the kind of guy, like, if I, if I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it, no matter how stupid it is. And so... So I was like, I, I'm going to keep training. I'm going to run this marathon. I didn't even want to do it in the first place. Like, if a friend pressures you into running a marathon, they're not a good friend. Okay? <laughs> friends don't talk friends into running marathons. That's just, that's just a rule. So I go to Chicago to run this marathon, and uh, it ends up being the hottest Chicago marathon in history. And so we're running this, 
and they literally ran out of water. Like you talk about you only had one job. It's a marathon. Just get water. You know, people are bringing hoses out from their, from their houses and their restaurants and everything, filling up cups for people. They, they started shutting things down. They were telling people, they were making announcements that they're not even keeping track of time anymore. Please stop running. Get in the bus. I'm like running like other people are still running. I was like, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I've come this far. I want to finish. I had a guy literally pass. I'm, I'm running, and he's slowing down, and he's catching up. I'm catching up with him. And he literally passed out right in front of me. I caught him. Like, people, it was crazy. I don't know if you've been thirsty before. Like, really thirsty. But I finished this thing, and all I wanted was, I feel like I was drinking water for, like, three days nonstop, you know, trying to replenish. And our thirst that is for God is an eternal thirst. And so often... We try to fill it. We try to quench that thirst with such insignificant things. I had a friend. <laughs> we, we were doing this summer camp, and we're not getting much sleep at night. And he's drinking all kinds of coffee and energy drinks and stuff, trying to stay awake. It's hot. We're working outside in the heat. And he's supposed to give a talk that night at the summer camp. And right beforehand, he passes out and had to go to the hospital from dehydration. Because coffee and energy drinks do not hydrate you. But so often, we try to fill that thirst with other things when ultimately we're thirsting for God. And the crazy thing for me to think about is that God is thirsting for us. Yeah, we thirst for God, but the, the God, this all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving God, thirsts for us. He doesn't need us. We need God, so it makes sense. He doesn't need us. He is everything. But yet he thirsts for us. Which to me is even greater. If my wife needed me, like if, if we had to get married because she was forced to marry me or because she had some kind of physical disability and needed somebody to, to take care of her or something. And the, hey, I know a solution. Let's get married. That would be totally different. But the fact is she doesn't need me but she wanted to marry me. God doesn't need us, but he desires us. The same God who created us out of love, like just love creates and desires to be in communion with us. In the beginning, God created. The first five words of the Bible. We would not exist if God didn't love us. If God stopped loving you right now, poof, you're gone. Because the only reason you exist is because of God's love. But then we mess it up. Right? We sin. We, 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 we sin against an eternal God. And we mess up this relationship that we have. So God says, I've got a solution for it. Dylan, can you, can you jump up here real quick? This is my man, Dylan. Give him a round of applause. I invite Dylan up, and then I walk away from him. Dylan, uh, one of the most popular verses, if not the most popular verse in the Bible, is John 3.16. Can you tell me John 3.16? Sir, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Give it up for Dylan. <laughs> All right, I, I don't want to make things awkward, but um, Dylan, I love you. I love you too, man. Thanks, Dylan. 
Yeah. And I want Dylan to get to heaven. In fact, after myself, my wife, and my kids, Dylan, you're next on the list. <laughs> Along with 7.1 billion other people, <laughs> roughly. I want Dylan to get to heaven, but I can't say for Kyle so loved the world that he gave his son so that anybody who believes in God would have eternal life. I mean, call me a bad Christian, but I'm not willing to sacrifice my son for you. Sorry. <laughs> Let's give Dylan a round of applause. John 15, 13 says, there's no greater love than this than to lay down one's life for a friend. God shows us the greatest form of love. Like, if there was a greater form of love, he probably would have done that. But there's no greater love than this than to lay down your life for a friend. See, I cannot imagine sacrificing my son for you. But it's kind of a broken analogy because God the Father and God the Son are one God. So in reality, it's God sacrificing himself for you, his son, or for you, his daughter. And that I can understand because I have kids and I would do anything for them. Our youngest son, Xavier, was, was sick. He's three months old, and uh, we took him to the doctor. We took him to specialists. We took him to the hospital. Couldn't figure out what was going on. And finally, after all these examinations, all of these scopes down the throat and x-rays after x-rays, they finally figured out that the muscle at the top of the stomach wasn't really working. And so basically, the contents of his stomach which would be whatever food, milk he drank, and stomach acid were just free to move up and down his esophagus at will, sometimes coming out, which isn't good. So we take him in, and they're going to do this procedure where they sew the top of the stomach shut, basically, and then you put in a little tube, a little access port, a button, in directly into the stomach so that you can administer feeds straight into the stomach and bypass the whole esophagus. So we do this procedure, and he's, he's starting to get better. We're hopeful. And then he starts taking a turn for the worse. It seems like he's getting sick again. And they start looking, trying to figure out. They don't know what's going on. More x-rays. And these x-rays, every time they're doing x-rays, it's like video x-rays. So it's like thousands of x-rays at a time. So they take him in, and they finally figure out that the, the little button, that tube, had popped out of the stomach, but didn't pop out from the skin. And so when we were pumping, with this little machine, pumping milk into him, instead of it going into the stomach, it was going all over his body, which is not good. So he's getting sick. He's not getting nutrition. But instead, he's getting like this crazy infection. So they cut him open. They take, basically have to take out his organs, rinse everything off, put everything back in, sew him back up, put that button back in, and we're starting all over again, now with a weaker baby. Because every time he goes in for a surgery, we have to starve him again. So we're hoping for the best. He's supposed to be on his way to recovery. And again, takes a turn for the worse. He's getting sick again. Do all kinds of tests, find out it's infected. That really, the reality of getting all of that milk out of there was very hard. And so something was still in there, got infected, have to cut them open, pull everything out, rinse it all out, put it back in, sew them back up again. Comes back out of the operating room, we weren't positive he was going to make it, and he's laying on this hospital bed with so many tubes, so many IVs. The kid has been stuck with so many needles, 
He's got a respirator. He has a tube going from his nose down into his stomach. And I remember looking at him, just wishing that I could trade him places. Knowing that I would do anything. That I would take on 10 times, 100 times the pain if I could be in that position, laying in the bed instead of him. So in a weird way, I get it. I can understand wanting to sacrifice myself for my son. I would do it in a second. I don't like it. I don't like it that Jesus had to go through this tremendous pain and torture and sacrifice for me. I don't like it, but I get it. See, our, our, our reading from Romans 5.8, right before it, Romans 5.7 It says, indeed, only with difficulty does one die for a just person. Though perhaps for a good person, one might find courage to die. Yeah, we, we can maybe understand dying for a good person. But our verse 5.8 says, God proves his love for us. And that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. He proves it. He doesn't just say, I love you. The God that is love demonstrates the greatest example of love so that we can be with him. His thirst for us is so great that he would do anything. The, uh, the crucifixions were horrible. The Romans were, were good at one thing, and that was killing people. And doing it in the most painful way possible. They had it down to a science. So Jesus is ridiculed and mocked. All of this verbal abuse, accusing him of all of these things. And the whole time, he thirsts for you. And in reality, if we're honest, yes, some Christians are persecuted in this world. There's some people that are killed for their faith. But for most of us, if not all of us, the worst we'll ever have to endure for our faith is some kind of verbal abuse. Somebody making fun of us, not understanding us. But then they, they scourge Christ, which we imagine this whip that he's beaten with, which would be horrible. But in reality, the whip has on the end of it these tassels. And coming off of the tassels, there's rock and fish hooks. And it's like this torture device that when it, when it hits his flesh, when it hits his back, it doesn't just bruise him or leave a mark, but it actually is ripping his skin. And as he's bleeding out, they could have killed him by just scourging him to death. But they would stop just short of death so that he was in the most possible pain and had to just live with that for a while. And the entire time that he's being scourged, he's thirsting for you. They take a, a crown of thorns, which, you know, we might imagine a thorn bush. You know, if I am picking raspberries in our backyard, I get pricked by a thorn and I cry like a baby. But the thorns that they would have used 
are more like these spikes, these hard nails, basically, off of this vine that they would have set on his head and beat into his head with a stick, mocking him the entire time. And while he was doing that, he was thirsting for you. Then he has to carry his cross up this hill, this heavy wooden beam, falling out of pain and exhaustion, thirsting for you. And then he gets to the top of the hill. The reason they went up to the top of the hill was not so it could be on big public display. In fact, by this point, hardly anybody's still around anymore because the crucifixion was so gruesome that they had to take it out of town so people didn't see it. And then they take nails, press it up against his skin, and pound it in with a hammer, hoist him up on the cross, And he's hanging from the cross. And he says, I thirst. Not for water, but for souls. He was thirsting for you. Not for a collective us, not for everyone, but for you as an individual. His love is so great. I've had the privilege to spend time with some of the Sisters of Charity, which is Mother Teresa's order. And if you go into one of their chapels, it's super simple. There's you know, the tabernacle and an altar and a crucifix. And then on the wall of every chapel is the words, I thirst. Those words were so important to Mother Teresa. As Kelly was saying yesterday, she would have her sisters say their name followed by I thirst. She wants to constantly be reminded that God is thirsting for us. He wants us so badly. He wants a relationship with us. He wants us to spend eternity with him. He would do anything to have us with him. There's a, a reflection based on the teachings of Mother Teresa that I'd like to share with you. And it's told through the perspective of Jesus. And so as I read it, what I'd like you to do is to really imagine Jesus speaking to you. Again, not to us, not to we, not to everyone, but just to you, these words. And so if, if you could uh, just close your eyes, go ahead and um, you know, sit up, feet flat on the floor. Close your eyes and just imagine Jesus speaking directly to you. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. It's true, I stand at the door of your heart day and night, even when you're not listening, even when you doubt it could be me, I'm there. I await even the smallest sign of your response, even the least whispered invitation that will allow me to enter. And I want you to know that whenever you invite me, I do come, always, without fail. Silent and unseen, I come, but with infinite power and love, and bringing the many gifts of my spirit. I come with my mercy, with my desire to forgive and heal you, and with a love for you beyond your comprehension. Nothing in your life is unimportant to me. I have followed you through the years, and I have always loved you. 
even in your wanderings. I know every one of your problems. I know your needs and your worries. And yes, I know all your sins, but I tell you again that I love you, not for what you have or haven't done. I love you for you, for the beauty and dignity my Father gave you by creating you in his own image. It's a dignity you've often forgotten, a beauty you've tarnished by sin, but I love you as you are. And I've shed my blood to win you back. I know what's in your heart. I know your loneliness and all your hurts, the rejections, the judgments, the humiliations. I carried it all before you. And I carried it all for you. So you might share my strength and victory. I know especially your need for love. How you're thirsting to be loved and cherished but how often you've thirsted in vain by seeking that love selfishly, striving to fill the emptiness inside you with passing pleasures, with the even greater emptiness of sin. Do you thirst for love? Come to me, all you who thirst. I will satisfy and fill you. Do you thirst to be cherished? I cherish you more than you can imagine to the point of dying on a cross for you. I thirst for you. Yes, that's the only way to even begin to describe my love for you. I thirst for you. I thirst to love you and to be loved by you. That's how precious you are to me. I thirst for you. Come to me and I will fill your heart and heal your wounds. I will make you a new creation and give you peace. You must never doubt my mercy, my acceptance of you, my desire to forgive, my longing to bless you. I thirst for you. If you feel unimportant in the eyes of the world, that matters not at all. For me, there is no one any more important in the entire world than you. Don't you realize my Father already has a perfect plan to transform your life beginning from this moment? Trust in me. Ask me every day to enter and take charge of your life, and I will. I promise you before my Father in heaven that I will work miracles in your life. Why would I do this? Because I thirst for you. All I ask of you is that you entrust yourself to me completely. I will do all the rest. When you give me your sins, you gave me the joy of being your savior. There's nothing I cannot forgive and heal. So come now and unburden your soul. No matter how far you may wander, no, how to, no matter how often you forget me, no matter how many crosses you may bear in this life, there's one thing I want you always to remember. One thing that'll never change. I thirst for you, just as you are. You don't need to change to believe in my love for it will be your belief in my love that will change you. You forget me, and yet I'm seeking you every moment of the day, standing at the door of your heart and knocking. Do you find this hard to believe? Then look at the cross. Look at my heart that was pierced for you. All your life, I have been looking for your love. I have never stopped seeking to love you and be loved by you. You have tried many other things in your search for happiness. Why not try opening your heart to me right now, more than you ever have before? When you do open the door of your heart, whenever you come close enough 
You will hear me say to you again and again, not in mere human words, but in spirit. No matter what you have done, I love you for your own sake. Come to me with your misery and your sins, with your troubles and needs, and with all your longing to be loved. I stand at the door of your heart and knock. Open to me, for I thirst for you.